Path Professional is a complete design suite for the single engineer or small design group. Design challenges being faced by engineers today are getting more and more complex. And it's not just the electrical, it's also dealing with the mechanical interfacing. So let's see how the Path Professional Design Suite can solve these challenges for the design engineer. In our example today, we're going to be showing a smart drill. You'll see here the mechanical engineer has designed the board outline and placed critical mounting locations for us. Adding parts to our design should not be a complex task. The PADS Databook application, your data can come from your corporate ERP system or an engineering database that you've set up. And a little bit later, we'll talk about part supplier integration. So here we're searching for a component that we want to add into our design using parametric searching functions. We're first going to look for a little voltage regulator to add into our design. By picking the manufacturer's part number, you'll see we find the exact part that we want. We can then see the symbol and drag that item onto our schematic. Once it's been placed in our schematic, we can quickly hook it up using right-click draw net features. From there, we're going to add two additional parts into our schematic, the adjustment resistors to define the vo voltage for this output regulator. And again, we're going to type in the value in our data book window. It'll find the part that we're looking for. We can drag that onto our schematic and add the additional component as well. You'll notice as I move through the design that the tool has a nice alignment feature that allows me to make sure my components are perfectly aligned. Now that the circuit has been added, to facilitate faster design, we're going to reuse design content from another project. Very simple to do, open that project in another Path Professional Designer window. You'll see here I'm going to copy the hierarchical block information from that design. Go back over to the design that I'm working on and paste that in there. I can then grab that symbol and drag it onto my schematic. And then using connection automation, connect up the pins between the two devices. We can also automatically add the net names by clicking over the hierarchical block and choosing add net names to connect the nets. Let's take a quick look at all the blocks that I've added to make sure everything is there. We can double click into the first one and see the reuse information that I carried over from the previous design. Then we can look at the additional blocks that I've created to make sure everything is done. The next challenge I have is to verify that none of my nets on my board are going to have signal integrity issues. So let's analyze one of the nets that I have a concern with. Directly from the schematic, I can push this net into our hyperlink signal integrity tool that comes with Path Professional. Because I pulled all this part information from part database, all my model assignments have already been added to these parts. So I can quickly go in, simulate that net, set the frequency to the proper frequency I want to look at, in this case it's 32 megahertz, and see that I definitely have some concern here with this net, a lot of ringing and overshoot. To solve this problem, I'm going to go ahead and choose to add a series resistor uh, to slow down the edge rate a little bit in the reflections. This is simple to do by adding a component. I can choose to go in and set the value, or I can use the termination wizard inside of hyperlinks to determine the value for me based on board stack of information or driver receiver pin characteristics. Now that we've set the value, let's go ahead and simulate again and see what the signal looks like. You can see here it's clearly reduced the high frequency noise on the signal and reduced the ringing and overshoot. So let's go ahead and continue with this. In addition to adding passive components, we can also look at the stack up and see how we can affect the signal integrity. So looking at our basic stack up, we want to make some adjustments. Let's separate some of the internal ground plane layers and set some of the ground plane layers closer to the signals, which will improve our signal quality as well. In doing this, we're going to run the termination wizard again because the pedance characteristics of our traces have changed, which is more likely going to change the value of our resistor, which you can see here it does. It changes it to 30 ohms. We'll go ahead and simulate again and see that our signal still looks the way it should. But let's go ahead and continue with this 30 ohm resistor. After doing a quick search in our database, I can see that I don't have a 30 ohm resistor, so I'm going to have to add a new part. Let's go to PartQuest. PartQuest is a free tool that's available to all Path Professional users. Let's go ahead and search for our 30 ohm resistor. As you can see, we've found multiple parts that are available from DigiKey. Let's pick a part that looks like it's most readily available and has the lowest cost. So let's go ahead and download the content from PartQuest. This will give me the symbol, the footprint, and a step model of the part. And then with a simple click of a button from within Pads Designer, this will load the content into my library. Now that I've downloaded that, you'll see it's in our database. I can go search for that part, add it to my design, simply drop it on that net, it auto-connects itself in, and I can move on to the next phase. 
Before I move on to generating a bill of materials, I want to make sure that all the parts in my design have the proper attributes so that I don't have any errors in my bill of materials or have to do any corrections afterwards. So let's go ahead and do a quick verification on all of our parts back against the database. You'll see here that most every component comes back with a green light, but I have one that seems to have missing attributes or the wrong attribute information. Let's click on that part and go visit it in the schematic and see that it's set to three mega, which is not found in the database based on the other attribute information. So very quickly, I can right click over that, do a search, see that the value is a mismatch. Go ahead and remove that condition and see that we find a 3.3 .3 mega ohm resistor, which is what this is supposed to be. We'll go ahead and select that part, do an update and fix the schematic. Now everything in our schematic is 100% correct. One of the big challenges engineers and companies deal with today is creating variants of their assemblies. This is very easy with Pads Designer. It has built-in functionality for doing variant management. You'll see here I'm going to add a new variant to this design for a low-end product. We then get a spreadsheet view of each one of those product lines, and then I can see all of the components, cross pro back into the schematic to see where the parts are, and choose to replace or unplace that component. For this low-end product, we're going to remove the LCD display from the drill. As with everything we do, we have to document that. So for each one of our variants, we can go in and view that variant, and then I can produce a PDF output of that schematic design, showing that that part is not being loaded. In addition to seeing the basic schematic, I also have intelligence built in. I can pop into Heracle Blocks, and I can view attribute information on components, and I can also cross-probe nets in the PDF. Now that we've created documentation schematic, let's go back and create all the bill of materials for each one of the variants. Bill of material output is fully customizable and can be generated all at once. And we can produce an Excel file that can be directly imported into an ERP system. As the electrical engineer, I want to be able to control my constraints for the PCB layout if I'm not doing the layout. So from directly from the schematic, I can open up this constraint editor application, which is the exact same information the PCB designer will see. You'll see here, I'm going to create a power class with my power nets in it, and then I'm going to set up my appropriate trace width information for each of the individual layers, which can be done very quickly using this Excel-based environment. Additionally, we want to define spacing between copper objects in the design. So we can do that quickly again in our spreadsheet. I can set one cell, and I can use drag and drop methodology like I do in Excel to make it quick and easy. Lastly, I know I have some high-speed constraints in this design, so I'm going to go and set some high-speed length requirements for my nets. In addition to doing these basic things, we can also do area-based design rules and complex topology along with blind and buried vias and virtual pins. Right. Now that we have all the rules created, we're going to move on into the layout. So let's go ahead and choose a template, start our design from the schematic, and take advantage of that mechanical engineering content. He's going to use his collaboration interface to generate output from an X in this case. We will then use our collaboration interface to import that data into our board design, making the process of creating the board outline and placing critical mounting holes extremely simple. Part of capturing the schematic allowed me to generate groups for components to make it easier for component placement. So here, using our component explorer, you can see I've got three groups of components. We can go ahead and drag those groups onto our PCB and do some placement strategy to make sure that we have enough space to place our parts and that the connections between those components are in roughly the right locations. This process facilitates faster placement of the component. Using further automation in Pads Professional, we can auto-place components and then adjust them as needed. Built-in schematic viewing technology allows me to view the schematic directly inside my layout tool. Using this view, I can select components in the schematic and have it cross-probe and find them in the layout for me to help speed up the process of component placement. Using the copy and paste feature, I can replicate circuits that are duplicates, which we're doing here with this resistor and capacitor circuit. So to mitigate the challenge of going back and forth with mechanical engineer, we can bring in mechanical features into the PCB tool. In this example, I brought in a piece of the drill to make sure I don't have any collisions when placing components. To make this more interactive, we can set up three-dimensional DRC rules. Here we're going to set up component to mechanical design role height requirement. So as I place this IC, I can clearly see when I have a collision with that component, or if I'm near a collision when it turns yellow. If we look at a side view of the PCB in the mechanical structure, we can see that there's an overhang of the board, and this is where the collision was occurring. So now we can place the part appropriately. We may not want to place all of our parts in 3D, but we can at least use the 2D and 3D view together. So I can still place some of my parts in a 2D environment, but I can also see what it looks like in that 3D environment. 
Another example of taking advantage of having the MCAD in the PCB world is I can see where parts are again overhanging the board where I may not have access to those components from the top and I can adjust my placement before having to do iterations with the mechanical engineer. Now that we're done with our placement, I want to send the PCB information back over to the mechanical engineer just so he can do a verification that I placed like a connector in the right place. So using the collaboration capabilities in PAS Professional, I can output the entire PCB and all of its model information to the mechanical engineer. The mechanical engineer can then use the collaboration interface on their side to import all of my component placement information and verify if I've placed everything in the right locations. Clearly, he can see that I did not put the mating connector for the LCD display in the right location. Instead of the mechanical engineer reporting back to me that this connector needs to move in a certain XY direction, they can simply move the connector into the proper location and then send back a collaboration file. While in PADS Professional, I can import that collaboration file and see that that connector has moved to a new location. I can then choose to accept or reject this change based on my knowledge of assembly. We will go ahead and accept this change by typing in a note, sending it back to the mechanical engineer to let them know that this has been accepted. When I hit apply, the connector will now move to its new location. Now that the mechanical engineer and I agree on the placement of components, let's go ahead and move on to the routing phase of the PCB. Again, to facilitate faster design, I'm going to use routing automation capability in PADS Professional. To start out, I'm going to fan out a couple components so that I don't have to do this manually. Once it's fanned out, I notice a couple items need to be changed, so I'm going to adjust their placement of the vias. After assuring the power on ground fanout and signal fanouts are where I want them to be, I'm going to use routing automation again to place traces. Using sketch route technology in Pass Professional, I can quickly select a couple nets, drag a line across the screen where I want those nets to be routed, and the tool will do the work for me, noticing that these traces are being drawn very much like how I would have drawn them myself. Moving on to the next group of nets, again I select a few net connections, draw a line across the screen where I want them to go, hit sketch route, and the nets are placed in. With the third group, we can see that it's interlacing between some vias, which I know I can fix by moving the vias. So again, using interactive route technology and professional, I can very quickly move these vias and do cleanup on those nets with very little manual interaction. Next section of the board, I wanted to control the fan out of these capacitors. So I'm going to go ahead and route one of those in and then using copy paste technology quickly replicate that onto the other capacitors. Next we're going to define our plane areas on the board. Again using automation I don't have to draw plane shapes. With dynamic plane capability I could just use the route outline which already exists as a plane area shape. In the case of this layer I have two voltages that I want. So I'm going to have to draw in another plane shape. But again, using dynamic capability, the tool automatically floods the layer, and as I make adjustments to that shape, it will automatically fill it in. I also have a pin for this net that requires high current. So very quickly on the fly, I can select that pin, go and adjust the pad stacks for larger thermals without having to go into my library or pad stacks. Again, I can adjust the shape very quickly to adjust to make sure I have enough thermals for this net. Before moving on to manufacturing, I want to do some electrical verification and obviously DRCs on my design. So let's take a look at that net that I looked at earlier from the schematic level to make sure it's still electrically correct based on the routing that was performed in the design. We can take our design from the layout into hyperlinks. Once the design is loaded, I can select the net of concern, simulate it, and see that yes indeed, the signal quality is as expected. While I was doing component placement, routing, plane creation, and everything, there was DRCs being performed on the design automatically. But there wasn't detailed fabrication design role checking being performed on the fly. One of the challenges many times overlooked is verifying your design for fabrication. Path Professional includes a comprehensive set of design rules for design for fabrication. These can be run at any point in time during the design, but in this case we're running it at the very end. From the DFF dialog box, you have full control over what layers are being checked, what types of objects are being checked, and what types of rules are being run. Here's a quick view of many of the design rules that are available for you to set. Proximity to signal, proximity to drill, proximity to solder mask, signal, plane, drill, solder mask, silkscreen, solder paste. Your rules can be saved into configuration files and then reused in various designs or between several different users. So to simplify the process of running your DFF rules on a new design, you can simply choose one of the schemes that have already been created and click proceed to perform the action. 
Once the rules have run, you can go to your Hazard Explorer. There'll now be a DFF tab available. There you can see each category and if there's violations or not. In this case, we'll look at a couple of solder mask to proximity violations. You can navigate to them by simply clicking on them in the Hazard Explorer. It'll take you to that violation in the design. Once found, you can use the push and shove technology in Pads Professional to simply fix the issue. Not performing this level of verification can lead to fabrication delays, assembly delays, and possibly quality issues down the road. Our last step to perform in the design process is outputting all of our manufacturing data. Pads Professional once again takes advantage of reusing content that's been created with previous designs. Using the Manufacturing Output dialog box, we can use pre-configured output files to quickly generate our manufacturing data. As an added benefit, Pads Professional includes an ODB++ viewer. This allows you to view the ODB Plus data before you send it out. You also have the ability to generate Gerber and compare the Gerber against the ODB Plus Plus data. To recap, during this video, you saw a complete design solution for the single engineer or small design team. This solution included all the tools necessary to meet your design challenges. Schematic capture, analog simulation, signal integrity, stack up design, supplier integration, library automation, along with kind of capture, analog simulation, collaboration with mechanical engineering, 3D design, and lastly, design for fabrication.